50. I think we need to get a bit higher. Sixty. Let's give ten more seconds, and then we're going to see um, who we have in the room. Okay, so biggest uh, portion coming from um, civil society, good um, representation of our colleagues from the UN um, here in the region. But also, um, if you accumulate all together, um, one third of private sector um, and supporting organizations um, of private sector. So I think it's a good mix. I'm actually quite pleased um, to see this. Um, I would have expected um, this not being so equal. So that is good news. So I think we can have a very meaningful conversation. My colleagues told me I'm not gonna do a third poll. Um, it's gonna take too much time, but I still wanna do this. We have one more question for you. I think it's important we know who's in the room, but we also want to understand what's your current um, temperature this morning? How happy are you? Very simple question. What's the happiness level in the room? I'm gonna launch. Um, a different um, poll. And I think um, Asia Pacific being the region that hosts um, a country which is measuring the cross um, happiness product, I think we have a right to ask this question, right? How we are doing, people respond. 60, see, that's an easier question apparently, it goes faster. Okay. Oh, so we are more on the down um, side, which is good. Uh, more than 50%, um, I would say, are happy to very happy, um, even some nines, which is great. So let's make sure we keep the happiness level and move some of the ones that um, for whom it's maybe early in the morning or late in the evening and needs a bit of a booster. Let's make sure we're going to. Um, get this done with a, a quite an um, interactive um, panel this morning. So we know who's in the room. We have a relatively happy audience. I think we're ready to kick in in the thematic. And to do this, um, we're going to start with a little um, video, just setting a little bit of scene. Um, watch carefully, because we're going to have some more questions um, after that um, from your end and want to get your reflections. Here we go. unmuting would help. Um, so we have learned um, through some of our research um, or rapid assessment of the crisis that one of the sectors that actually is benefiting or at least not being so much impacted as others is the technology um, sector. And so what we're going to do during the session, a little bit of capacity building on technology. So it's not finished yet. So we're going to do one more um, feedback loop um, from your end. 
and I would like to ask you, um, take your phones or your um, laptops, menti.com. Um, you're gonna need this throughout the session, um, probably a little bit more. So why don't you all go to menti.com and there's a code on the, on the screen, 544748, 544748. And what we would like to um, hear from you is um, three words and no sentences, three words, describing the most, uh, what stands most out um, from watching that video. The intent is to build up a little bit of a word cloud to also see areas that we want to take forward in our conversations um, where you would like to talk about as well. We're gonna be talking about women. We're gonna be talking about um, youth, no worries. Empowerment, economy, obviously. Um, okay. I think you're all in the right panel. I think everything what comes up um, is gonna be um, discussed. And I think we, um, have done this for a long time now. And I think um, the panel also deserves to um, be part of this um, conversation now, but I think it gives us all a bit more um, a good view on what areas um, to highlight um, and discuss a little bit more in detail. And with this, um, I really gonna not wait much longer and turn it over um, to the panel. And um, the first person I'm gonna speak to is um, actually one of our young entrepreneurs um, from the Youth CoLab. Um, I'm having the pleasure to introduce um, Leigh from the, the Philippines, and she is an active um, participant in the Youth um, CoLab. And through the work um, of her in, in partnership with the Youth CoLab, she has been developing a fabulous enterprise called AI for Government. And I think um, she went through a journey that she had told um, to us and we have experienced. Mm -hmm. This was a, a really a, a big one and a fast one, and particularly an important one in the current context um, of COVID. And I would love, um, Leigh, to share a little bit more about AI for governments. Um, what does it um, do and how does it help to build a more inclusive and sustainable um, society in the Philippines? And also, Leigh, please share with us a little bit of your journey as a female and young entrepreneur operating in technology. I think there are, it calls out for lots of barriers, um, just uh, listening to that, but we would love to hear more about your journey. Over to you, Leigh. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I need to holla at the Youth Collab team who, is, who are with us. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Leigh. So as mentioned, I'm the co-founder of AI for Golf, a golf tech startup dedicated to improve public services using technology, data science, and community organizing. Uh, so um, I think a good context in, in what we have done is that we started as young civil servants, right? After graduating, you have your first job, and then we were dedicated public servants. But then at, at, after our work hours, we're also very dedicated um, youth leaders. So always active in community building, have several organizations. And I think that's an important um, a part of our journey because personally, when you didn't come from a uh, background of privilege, you, you're not that confident. And youth leadership networks that you expose yourself with allows you to be, you know, from small to have a larger and bigger expansion of networks. And then after a while, you, you feel more confident. And then after a while, uh, you feel uh, that you can take on challenges. And I think after a few years in youth leadership work, you, you then believe, you then start to believe that maybe I can push myself further, we can push ourselves further, you can be introduced with different um, people. So then I think that was the um, journey of transformation that I've experienced personally. And to be honest, even speaking English, I mean, three years ago, I was afraid of, you know, what I call, you know, white people or foreign people. I was afraid to talk to them because I'm not very good at English. But then after a while, when you continue to challenge yourself and expose yourself, then, then you get to have like, um, 
you know, self-discovery. And then if you combine that with elements of your background, for example, my background is in community development experience, which is in public service. And then that self-belief that you've gained along the way about leadership, innovation, bridging divides. And then when you combine that together, and then a youth collab call in the Philippines uh, was, was uh, published that there's a call for innovations. Uh, we call it Hack Society in the Philippines back in 2018. That was the perfect opportunity to basically combine all of these elements together and um, attempt to attempt to have a project and then we're just fortunate that in the governance category of um, youth collab hack society in the philippines we we fit our background fit our in fact the team our, the team that we have right now at afrgov we met at different youth leadership um networks so we just combined uh, each other's uh, background and then voila we have like a a team that are dedicated and coming from a very deep a sense of wanting to make impact. And I think that's where we are. So, so I think that's the, the context of the background. But then at AI for Gov, um, after that uh, youth collab hack, so we started with saying, uh, how maybe we can use chatbots for public services in information, in providing uh, local government uh, services to the people. Because in the Philippines, uh, there's uh, ubiquity in, in the use of messenger and free data. So we believe very early on that this is a very innovative way of surveying, of surveying people, of providing information and access. And then from that context, it grew further and further. So first we were partnering with a single municipality on, on conducting AI experiments. And then suddenly we are working with the Department of uh, interior and local government, which is regional uh, in the Philippines. And then when COVID came, actually before COVID came, we also were doing um, emergency response bot because there, there was a Taal eruption, a volcano near the capital erupted. So then we made um, emergency response bots to help our, our government. And then after that, within a very um, short period of time, COVID was suddenly like a, a spike suddenly spiked in the Philippines. So from our Taal eruption bots, we pivoted towards a COVID bot. And then after a few days, we found ourselves pitching uh, to the Department of Health together with you know, bigger tech startups. And we were very, very small at that time. And, and to point that out, and then you know, once you're now faced with the challenge and then real world comes in and then we have other bigger tech startups in the room, then you start becoming, again, at least what I've experienced personally, is that then you begin to have self-doubts. So then we were like having self-doubts at the moment. Can we actually do this? Can we actually do something that is, you know, as big as COVID, as, uh, with high risk, but we're a small team, we haven't done this before. But I think uh, the experience was, if we kept on pushing on, we then saw that the products that we're making can actually, you know, be can actually um, be. Although we, we have less experience, the products that we're producing were good. We're, so the government liked it. It was at par with what the bigger tech industries were were producing. So then we kept on pushing on, and I suppose uh, because we were public servants before, that gave us a competitive advantage in navigating towards the bureaucracy. So with, then we started um, knowing how to uh, build champions and co-ownership inside the government and having patience and then pushing on until um, after a lot of weeks, I think that was six weeks since we pitched, uh, then the Department of Health actually announced uh, the partnership. And uh, these are Kira chatbots or um, contra COVID. Uh, contra in the Philippines means fight. So it's like a fight COVID chatbots that allows uh, for self-checking, triaging, digital triaging that then links to the uh, local governments so that they can assess you and further respond to COVID needs. Um, it allows for fact-checking to mitigate um, uh, information or fake information. And then it also, uh, we also, uh, together with other tech startups, we built a knowledge base for the Philippines so that the machine can learn uh, from uh, different memorandums that are being published on a daily basis so that the public can be um, 
can be uh, guided. So, and then after that, just to within less than a year, so after after this, uh, the next uh, project that we're doing is actually now with the Department of Education. So when they heard that we were doing this with the Department of Health, after actually yesterday we pitched and then we got the project. We're now developing mental health triage chatbots in preparation for the school um, for for COVID for. Uh, uh, mental health preparation because of what's happening in the COVID for the for the education uh, sector to be uh, used by the school systems in the Philippines. So I think Lately, I want to... Yeah, sorry. Sorry, may I interrupt you? I think we will have a bit more um, of a chance to also talk about um, really sort of the solutions for COVID in our second round. So I think it's great. I think the audience knows now um, what... Um, what the, the, the AI for graph is. And I think it's amazing to listen to your story. Um, and I saw the faces of the other panelists as well. So I think it's incredible um, how fast you turned this um, enterprise um, or adapted this um, or pivoted this in the current context. Um, we'd love to hear more about your just the new pitch that you won and um, how this is impacting um, Philippine communities in the second round. I realized that I forgot to ask you before we um, started, making sure that you are at a, a good happiness level when starting um, this conversation. So before I hand over to um, Garaf, um, let me just um, pause here and just see where are you? I mean, from your talking, I would give you a 15 plus probably um, right now, but tell me. De definitely probably 20 plus because- okay. we we're ecstatic. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Leigh, for this. And I think um, you have kicked us off in a really um, passionate way. And I think that that shows again why it's small matters and why we need these passionate um, entrepreneurs in the region. And I have a second one um, who I cannot cluster in uh, the category female-led. And sorry, Gaurav, but I have to say you are also not qualifying anymore for a youth entrepreneur. But having said that, um, your journey and um, Dharma life um, is serving so many women. And Gaurav um, has an amazing um, story, which I had the privilege to, to follow over a longer time, um, starting off as an investment banker and now being a, a social entrepreneur. And he has been awarded as a youth, global youth leader from the World Economic Forum um, a couple of years um, ago. But I think the, the biggest award he's probably getting from the 50,000 women um, that he has formed the network of in rural India and helping to improve the life of the people living at the bottom of the pyramid in rural India. Kovaf, um, with this, um, I really would like to turn it over to you first knowing um, how you are feeling um, this morning and if you can keep up with the happiness level of our audience, but also giving us a very honest um, view. You have been a, an entrepreneur for a longer time than um, lay and in your business, but really sharing with us what kind of barriers and sleepless nights did you have over the past um, years and particularly last couple of months as well. Over to you. Sure, thank you, Katya. <clears throat> so great to be on on this uh, on the panel and happiness level. Yeah, I mean, early morning here in Germany, and uh, but I, I mean, energized early morning. So happy for sure and uh, excited. So um, basically, I mean, Dharma Life. Um, I'll briefly explain the model and then uh, how I got to this. So we basically create uh, women entrepreneurs at the village level in rural India, um, and so we go to these villages, which are typically. 500 households um, and clusters of 1,000 households, so clusters of two to four villages. We recruit women who are who don't have a job um, or need additional income. And then we train them uh, to become social entrepreneurs where they work on various uh, sustainable development goals such as energy access, hygiene, um, and uh, you know, basically uh, among other things, health and, um, and livelihood programs. Uh, post the training, they they work on uh, selling such uh, products and services. You can see on the slide uh, some of the products, so solar lights, water purifiers, um, clean cooking uh, stoves. Um, they, they basically sell these products door to door in the village community. They also drive a behavior change through um, community interactions. So we have, uh, we, we utilize all kinds of tools such as you know, master chef cooking competitions or, or school-based activities. Uh, and thirdly, they also drive, um, collect research and data and insights uh, and help us um, design appropriate solutions. So this is the business model we have. This is increasingly becoming digital. I'll talk about that in the, in, uh, in I mean, in the uh, shortly after in the challenges we faced recently. 
and we have a network now of 16,000 plus entrepreneurs, most of which are women, 75% uh, plus are women. Uh, and we've reached about 13 million people. So now this is Dharma Life. The model um, you know, was uh, kind of, Katya, you mentioned it, it's been an up and down and learning exercise for me. So my background is I was born and brought up in Germany um, and I worked in private equity and investment banking before this and um, have, um, you know, was doing this for six years, then decided that, um, you know, it's probably more impactful if I try to make a difference and move to, um, move to India. This was driven by a personal story where I went through a help episode, somehow survived it, uh, and then decided to uh, move to India to do this. Um, in terms of challenges, uh, I mean, obviously, this is a model where um, at the last mile, there's been a lot of struggle in terms of actually building sustainability uh, for such a, such, a, such a model. So we had to pivot uh, a lot. Um, I mean, the latest one being recently, but we did hit sustainability a couple of years ago, and we did this by combining the three revenue streams I talked about. And so the idea really is um, to have a sustainable model which reinvests its profits uh, to um, to scale up uh, further. Uh, and uh, the second challenge was, um, so one was sustainability. The second one was around actually impact. I mean, we started with as a gender neutral model. And um, so what happens is if you're you know kind of recruiting entrepreneurs, Unfortunately, I mean, only men, uh, a lot of men stepped forward. So we had a 90% male ratio uh, at the beginning. We however went back after a couple of years and started looking at what is the impact we're creating. And the impact for us was um, normally, it was initially measured as income. How much income are we creating for the entrepreneurs? But, uh, we, and how are the, the, how's the income used uh, later on? So in the survey, what came out was that uh, the, the money was not really used uh, appropriately um, it was spent on the, themselves when they were men. So this is obviously something which came on the study generally also. So we pivoted completely to our 10% women and have now made this thing 75, 80% female led. Uh, so we still work with the men, but it's a female led entrepreneur model. So that, so I'll just, for, these are two challenges. I, so, I mean, obviously the impact challenge so the pivot on that. Uh, I'll talk recent about the recent challenges, which were around, um, obviously right now, you know, our model is a physical model, right? Uh, we had some digital en enablement through apps, et cetera, but we had to, over the last uh, three months, completely pivot everything to digital-led. Um, so we have, I mean, it's still work in progress, but at least now we have been able to operate all our core modules. So behavior change program happens on Microsoft Teams with girls uh, on, uh, on, the, on the video chat and, uh, and uh, similarly uh, group meetings, digital sessions, all through the technology available, data bandwidth has drastically improved. So this has been the latest pivot and we're using this now to help kind of uh, preventive communication uh, around COVID with, uh, with, with our partners like Unilever and others. Uh, so that's kind of where we are uh, at this point and that's the latest uh, pivot. I'll stop here given the time in five minutes, but yeah, I'm sure there'll be more time uh, to discuss and for any questions. Perfect. Um, thank you very much, um, um, Gaurav. And we're gonna take some of these les lessons around digital um, leapfrogging, et cetera, in our second, um, Round, but what we've heard as well from from you, but also from Lay, I think the, the support system, the networks, um, are essential um, to entrepreneurs um, like you. And we have uh, Suchi um, with us today from Andy from the um, network, which is supporting um, entrepreneurs, um, but also corporates and others in that whole ecosystem, and really helping to provide a flourishing and thriving ecosystem for entrepreneurs. Um, which is essential to make um, everything what you just described a success. So Suchi, um, in the spirit um, or in the context of time, I'm not gonna say uh, much more about you and your exciting um, journey, but it would be great if you um, could share a, a little bit um, with us, what makes a thriving ecosystem for entrepreneurs in the Asia Pacific? Um, and are there any kind of trends um, that you are seeing, not only because of COVID, but in general um, in the region that are worth um, being highlighted. Over to you, um, Suchi. And I see you are happy, but don't forget uh, your happiness level. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm one of those just kind of ambivalent, Katya. Well, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining in. I'm at that, I was at that five and six, right? I think it's more because uh, given the current context, one wonders, and I think we have sort of much work to do. Maybe it's also because of the gray hair, and I don't have much of that uh, that uh, passion and enthusiasm that Lay bought. But I think I'm very hopeful. Um, in terms of the ecosystem, uh, 
I think you had many of what constitutes uh, the ecosystem in your video, right? You talked about uh, finance, business support, policy, creation of markets, human capital, infrastructure, R&D, culture. Um, and I think to your question of what creates a thriving ecosystem as far as this region goes, you know, the word comes from the biological ecosystem, right? And therefore I think it's also as complex um, and for a thriving ecosystem, it needs all of these various sort of aspects and entities to come together. And as you can see, that's a big challenge. Um, thank you, I know you said, we're, we're trying, we're trying to create a robust uh, ecosystem uh, by providing support to uh, wonderful entrepreneurs like Gaurav and, and Lei, we hope. Um, so that's, that's quickly around that. And I think you can get a sense of why it is so challenging, right? Because there are so many different aspects. Um, and just use an example, uh, when Lei was talking about her journey as a woman entrepreneur, she sort of brought up uh, in some ways the barrier of language, right? Which would fall under the culture bucket in some ways. And it's, it's not something that gets discussed too much, right? We don't talk about the barrier that language creates, but for many of us countries in this region, um, English isn't really uh, our mother tongue. We don't think and dream and it doesn't come naturally to us. And I think a large section of SMEs, especially at the S end, um, don't necessarily converse in English, right? And I think by default, in many ways, we create a barrier right there. Uh, and that's just an example of why creating this ecosystem and a vibrant one is such a complex problem. And I think really needs many of us to come together uh, if we're going to succeed. Uh, the slide that we have there, and I think that was, that was the next question, Katya, and I might be jumping ahead. Uh, but I think specifically since we're talking about women uh, purpose-led uh, enterprises, um, this is data that uh, came up from um, Global Accelerator Learning Initiative Program that we have at Andy that's looked at close to 14,000 ventures uh, across the world uh, and collected data, right? And these are the key findings that are specific to the topic of uh, women enterprise. Right, which is if you look at incubation and acceleration uh, programs across the world, uh, women-led ventures are underrepresented. I don't think you'll see anything that's super surprising here, right? But the idea is to share some of the data that you actually see to buttress many of these things that I think most of us have a reasonably good sense of. Um, women-led ventures have less investment coming into acceleration and they appear to be less investment oriented, you know, and we can go into what that really means. Uh, but this is, this is one of the key findings that we have. Uh, worrisome is the fact that acceleration alone does not really close the financing gap, right? So once they're done with their acceleration programs, it doesn't necessarily mean they're able to raise significantly more funds vis-a-vis uh, -vis their, uh, you know, the other teams. Um, and definitely that representation within programs has an impact on the gender diversity of applicant pools, right? What this means is, uh, as you can see from the data there, having women mentors and having more women on your selection panel does sort of try to balance thing, things out, but it's really unclear what methods actually really help women-led ventures grow. So um, as you can see, probably more questions that the data has shown up than answers, some that we hope to try and address. So a lot of follow-up work. One of the things as an example that we're trying to do is uh, we have, um, we put together a fund to answer one particular part of the many questions, which is what are the models of support that we need to put in place for women-led enterprises or women entrepreneurs uh, to actually get them to be able to get more of this funding, right? And that's that's just an example of, there's a lot more work that actually needs to be done on that front, but this, this is the summary of what we find. And I will pause there because I'm not sure where we are in time. <laughs> It's great. I didn't stop you because I think it, it's really important to um, really sketch this um, picture um, of um, the whole ecosystem. Thank you so much, um, Suchi, and also the data, which I think is really helpful, um, particularly for us as well, to, to, to design um, solutions moving forward. 
But speaking about the ecosystem, I think one player um, who is really important in the ecosystem are obviously um, governments, governments regulations. And I'm really pleased that we have um, not governmental representative itself, but that we have Ms. Um, Tong Di Nam Dang with us from Vietnam, um, who is the founder and director of the Center for Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship in Vietnam, and uh, a longstanding partner of the youth um, collab, but has been working a lot with the government in um, Vietnam. And interestingly shared with us that um, since 2014, if I'm saying something wrong, Ms. Tang, you're gonna correct me, but since 2014, 14, um, Vietnam is recognizing social enterprises as um, um, specific um, enterprise. And yet, since since that um, time, since 2014, the number of social enterprises is about 1,000 in uh, Vietnam and has been stable. So spite of this um, progressive or of this um, recognition, um, it seems that um, there's not many more social enterprises moving into the space. Um, so Ms. Tang, um, I would love also to hear and get your temperature this um, morning in Vietnam, but it would be great if you could share with us a little bit more around the role of um, governments and what you have been learning in your long experience working um, in Vietnam in this space. What's their role and um, yeah, how's the current status of this um, from your perspective? Okay, thank you, Racha. Um, good morning. Uh, actually, it's um, it's afternoon already in Vietnam, and it's hot here. It's uh, 40 degrees, and um, we feel very grateful because everything is open except the border. You know, if, you know, uh, and you know, like looking uh, in um, yeah, our, our friends abroad, uh, things are still closed, and we feel uh, really grateful. Uh, back to the um, the social entrepreneurship here in Vietnam. Um, for the last uh, five years, um, there's two things that affect a lot the, um, the development of the sector. Uh, the first one is uh, in the 2014, uh, the government unleashed the, um, uh, the social enterprise as um, in the enterprise law uh, that um, if a social enterprise need to register as a, as a business and uh, they need to have a clear uh, social environmental objectives and we invest at least 51% of profit back to serve the social and environmental objectives that, that, that they committed. So um, according uh, to the uh, regulations in Vietnam, uh, social enterprise must be a business. Um, uh, so uh, for, the, for the last five years, up to, you know, uh, really after five years, we recognize now um, 1,000 social enterprise. So actually, the, the number is not stuck. That means it's, it's, it's a grow, you know, a steady grow uh, from uh, 2015. That's uh, when the law come into effective up to now. Um, and at the same time, in 2016, the government um, uh, defined the 2016 to 2020 and with the vision of 2020, 20, uh, 2025 as the startup nation period. So, um, the, the government invests hugely uh, to the technology-based startup and a development of the entrepreneurship in general, innovation and entrepreneurship uh, in the country. So actually the social business, uh, purpose-led entrepreneurship, you know, benefit uh, from these two uh, uh, government policies, startup nation period and the, and the enterprise law. Um, um, actually, uh, yesterday when um, preparing uh, for the for the event today, I I just think okay uh, I need to compare uh, between the performance of um, of social enterprise in Vietnam with some champion in the region, and I think of South Korea. South Korea is kind of you know like Asian hub in terms of developing a social innovation and social enterprise, and uh, I see like in 2017 when um, uh, South Korea celebrating the 10 years of a social enterprise law, they recognize 1,700 social enterprises. And they currently have now 6 million business um, in the private sector. And in Vietnam, we have 1,000 and uh, 1,000 social enterprises and with less than 1 million business. So actually in, some, uh, in, some, in terms of percentage, it's not that small. 
And also in 2018, yeah, actually this is about social enterprise, but in 2018, um, I conducted a research of a, a country mapping with UNDP and uh, University of Northampton in UK. And we conducted research on the social impact business. That means the one who, who might register as social enterprise, but many others, they, they did not register, uh, register as social enterprise, but they claim like they balance between making profit and making positive impact on social, on, 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 on environment and, and society. And uh, we estimate about 4% of business sectors. That means that uh, uh, accounting for 22,000 22, uh, social impact business in Vietnam. So uh, actually um, uh, these, for the last two years, uh, CSIE, my Center for Social Vision Entrepreneurship and UNDP, we, uh, um, we work a lot on promoting the social impact business uh, definition here in Vietnam. And uh, now even the government use the word in their, start to use the word in, in their policy forums uh, because social impact business, it's more like aligned with the government uh, uh, policies about uh, promoting a technology-based startup. So uh, we are creating, with UNDP, we're creating the uh, Impact Tech Fest, uh, which is the national showcase of a technology-based uh, business startup here in Vietnam uh, with impact uh, a focus. So since 2018 and up to now, every year we run that kind of national showcase. And um, in terms of the ecosystem, we have many key players who are quite active, um, uh, like, um, and each of, each of the, the players uh, play their roles. Like um, we, we are under a university, a national economic university. So we work with British Council and myself, um, I sit in different advisory groups to ministry, um, you know, government uh, programs about entrepreneurship and startup. So um, uh, we work with British Council and Ministry of Education and Training to embed uh, social innovation and social entrepreneurship into teachings at your own university in Vietnam. With uh, UNDP, we work with Ministry of uh, Science and Technology to um, create, you know, competitions, incubation program, and also showcasing uh, Impact Tech Fest. And uh, some of the other key players, they, they, you know, like Oxfam and CSIP, they work with um, the promoting uh, inclusive business. Uh, so, um, so the key thing now, uh, we are, this year, we are reviewing the um, effectiveness of the five years on social enterprise law. And um, we expect that like uh, for the next years, uh, we can advocate for more uh, favorable policies for uh, social entrepreneurship sectors in here in Vietnam. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Tang. And um, having so many people in the panel that are working with entrepreneurs, I'm going to kind of repurpose the agenda a little bit because you get some questions which are fitting and we wanted this to be a conversation, right? So Ms. Um, Tang, there's a question for you. Um, speaking about um, legal services, um, can better access to legal advice and solution help remove some barriers faced by SMEs to achieve their objectives? And also on how to get uh, potentially um, into better legal advice, um, how to make this accessible for um, enterprises. So this is a question for me, right? That's a question for you, yes. Okay, yes, actually um, the legal advice is still um, uh, a, you know, a big, big problems here for, for SMEs and, and, and social enterprise uh, um, because you know, most SMEs uh, and social enterprise, they are micro business and they are one, key, one, man, um, one man players uh, business. So uh, most of the uh, uh, you know uh, SME founders they don't they are they don't have legal backgrounds and and also you know taxing and finance background accounting backgrounds um, yeah we try to um, um, the this is this is the efforts that we are trying is a kind of uh, creating a kind of one stop shop uh, for you know as a public service uh, for mm -hmm. social enterprise here. Uh, because even the if it, here in Vietnam, the Vietnamese government uh, recognized social enterprise as as a business, as a type of business, but there's no um, in financial incentive offer specifically for social enterprise. Um, so um, and uh, legal advice and how to register and how to enjoy some kind of you know potential incentive 
uh, as a social enterprise, uh, still um, a big question here in Vietnam. Katya, yeah. can I just sort of jump in to add sure. on top of that from the, you know, since you had sort of an ecosystem lens and, you know, asked me what will it take? I think an example here is what something like what the Thomson Reuters Foundation are offering through this offering called Trust Law. So what Trust Law does, it looks at crowdsourcing pro bono legal services that they offer free to nonprofits and social enterprises, right? So that I think is a very a powerful example of how people can come together in the ecosystem to offer something that is of need. And I do know that trust law operate uh, as far as the Asia Pacific go in Hong Kong, India, and Thailand. And, and I'm sure they're not the only ones. They're just an example of, but particularly around this question of legal, because it's certainly one of those things that is a significant barrier, especially if you look at uh, our ability to understand legalese uh, and for women entrepreneurs as well, you know, so that's a trend that we're seeing that it's an area that many, many entrepreneurs uh, request for and want support in. Thank you so much for um, contributing this, Suchi. I think that's what we want is giving very practical um, advice here, right, um, <clears throat> to, to help and support. Um, I'm going to kind of... Um, try to complete the ecosystem. So we have spoken about law, we have spoken um, about um, the entrepreneurs themselves, the support network um, that Andy is providing. Um, about who we have not spoken yet is the bigger corporate um, and businesses, the multinationals, but also the local bigger businesses. Um, and I'm pleased that we have um, Catherine Kirschenmann with us from um, the Do School. I think the name says it all. It's an organization that really um, does stuff. Um, and what do they do? And Catherine can allude to this a little bit more, but it's basically really connecting um, bigger companies and entrepreneurs um, together and with an overarching mission around um, driving purpose, sustainability, and inclusion. So Catherine, um, how does that landscape um, look like? We speak a lot about social entrepreneurs. What about purpose-led um, companies or companies and sustainability? What, what are the trends um, we see there? And also, I know you're very um, frank very often when we have conversations, but what are kind of the hurdles and the barriers um, for connecting entrepreneurs and um, multinationals um, together or other bigger companies. Over to you, um, and I know it's early in the morning, so I don't expect you um, to be the freshest and the happiest in Germany, but um, over <laughs> to you, uh, <laughs> Catherine. Thanks, Katya. Well, I think in terms of happiness level, I'm somewhere be between Suchi and Lei. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think I'm, I do see the challenges uh, and especially in the current circumstances, but I think it's great also again in this panel to hear, you know, to hear Lei, to hear Garaf and to see how entrepreneurs are particularly, you know, able to pivot in times like this to really respond and help overcoming some of those challenges. Uh, so I think that that's super encouraging. Um, and so to go more into your question, Katya, to look at the, the large businesses, and as you say, is it with the Do School, we're, we're working with, with both. And uh, there's, there's a couple of trends that we've been seeing uh, over the last, I would say, two years to really come together on the side of, of the corporates, which are encouraging, and, and I'll get there in terms of what that would mean for, for SMEs and also for purpose-led um, entrepreneurs and businesses. So uh, one we're seeing is that there's more and more pressure being put on large corporates to be part of the solution and not to be part of the problems. Uh, and this pressure actually now is coming from a lot more angles. So um, employees are starting to really speak up and, and they're doing it partly very publicly. You know, just in the last days we've seen uh, you know, engineers from Facebook resigning uh, publicly and also speaking out on Twitter against certain decisions uh, that were being made by Mark Zuckerberg. So this is, you know, just one example of how employees are putting pressure on their employers in terms of being sustainable, being part of the solution. Um, this is also something that customers are demanding a lot more. Um, and it's also something that increasingly financial markets are picking up as well like we've seen prominent examples uh, like BlackRock for example um, putting up pressure from investor side which I think is really really important um, 
So that's one trend that we've seen and obviously corporates understand that they need to react to it on all levels. Uh, there is also another uh, trend, and I think that's also that's good news for companies who have been purpose-led for a longer time, is that by now we really have the evidence and the data coming up that purpose-led large corporates are more successful in the long run. Um, so there's kind of this business case for purpose that people were waiting for to see, and, and we see that, that there's a higher brand value see that there's higher employee satisfaction um, associated with sort of higher level of purpose. And so I think that that's very encouraging for companies um, and to, to, you know, really approach that road if they haven't done so already. Um, and then uh, I think uh, at least here in Germany, and I know in a couple of other countries as well, what has happened, especially in the last 12 months, I feel uh, there have been numerous companies that have come out with publicly announcing really ambitious sustainability goals around carbon neutrality, for example, around circularity. And uh, I think that's great uh, because of course it puts uh, you know, a face to public debate, but also uh, in a sense, those companies are really committing to reaching those goals. And often those goals are you know, long-term goals. And I think the core question is for, for the companies then, how do we start now? to build solutions for goals around, say, we want to be carbon neutral in 10 years, but you have to start now. And I think that's, for me, also the point where I see sort of the, the link to, um, you know, to small business and entrepreneurs, because companies need new solutions. And of course, they're investing a lot in innovation. They see sustainability now also as a driver for innovation. But um, they also still need a lot in terms of building their own like strategies, their own um, structures and teams and knowledge. And so what has happened, and I think where I see really big potential is to actually turn to purpose-led enterprises, smaller scale entrepreneurs, who are really modeling those solutions. And if brought together, could actually um, you know, really harness those opportunities of collaboration with entrepreneurs. So I think I see that all these trends actually contribute to the need for solutions. And there is really interesting solutions in the market. So how do we bring them together? And that's probably the biggest question. And Katja, um, yeah, sorry, Katja. No, I was just wondering if you, you would like to um, share a um, more very concrete example um, on that um, since we are planning more kind of um, round one of questions, uh, round one and two of questions. So uh, happy if you would like to go ahead uh, with that. Yeah, for sure. So I think that's um, the example here um, and, and I'm obviously more, more than excited to talk about it. So, um, because as I said, like often there is a lack of access and there's also a lack of education of how to even talk to each other and how to come together to you know, to scale solutions that are already in the market. So how can entrepreneurs and large corporates work together? And um, so the industry disruptor is uh, one of those attempts to do exactly that. And we're, we, have launched, uh, we have launched this initiative, it's open for application. So for everybody out there uh, who is, you know, working in, um, in, as an entrepreneur uh, leading sort of a, a small enterprise. Um, so it's an opportunity where we really want to create access um, H&M has just signed up as um, first industry partner. So this is happening in the textile and fashion industry first, um, but the model could be applied to any industry. And it's a way where we're sourcing interesting enterprise solutions and then bring them together with industry partners um, at, to find uh, collaboration potential across the value chains. But it's obviously also about mentorship, about capacity building. Um, and I think this is one example where we can show and, and we've been we've just close to early bird uh, applications and we're now uh, in the second round of applications for for another week or so. Um, and, and we just see the amazing potential of entrepreneurs uh, of all ages. I'm very excited about that as well, um, who come in with solutions who are eager to scale um, and who, who will be empowered through that program. Great, thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing this. And just for everyone, we're gonna post the link also in the 
chat for um, interesting, interested um, entrepreneurs um, in the audience, but also for other corporates who might want to um, replicate this model into another industry or into another country. Um, really um, welcoming your um, outreach here and um, we're happy to, to, to work with you together. Um, I would like to just kind of add a little bit of spice into our um, con conversation and not make it sort of a second round. But um, obviously some of you have mentioned um, the impact of um, COVID on um, entrepreneurs, particularly on women entrepreneurs and on, on youth entrepreneurs. Um, so what I just would like to do um, moving forward is just giving a couple of um, data points from uh, interesting research that the Youth Collab has been undertaking and also um, UN Women. Um, I just want to say these are all snapshot analysis and rapid assessments. So far from being a sort of deep study, but sort of what we have seen is actually um, interesting um, as well in the youth space and the women's space. And I think to no surprise, um, companies um, or entrepreneurs have seen significant negative impact on, um, on their businesses. And I think this is this is true to all of the, the SMEs or to many of the SMEs. So I don't think that is only for female-led or youth entrepreneurs. I think the important thing is that very of these um, businesses are more fragile and don't have the, the resilience yet um, than, than many of other um, businesses. Um, what we also see, particularly from a um, female entrepreneurship um, perspective, a lot of women are obviously drawn into unpaid care work, uh, taking care responsibilities, kids not being in school. Unfortunately, we see in the region that uh, anyway, already the overproportional burden on women is just increasing through the crisis and it doesn't stop um, in front of female-led um, and or female-led businesses or female entrepreneurs. So they have a, a, a double um, impact here. And um, what we also, um, a number which I was quite um, surprised about, or not surprised, but shock, shocked actually about is the low access to um, tax reliefs or special, special um, governmental packages um, or other support. Um, I mean, there was early on research from the use collab, but only 9.5% um, have reported that they um, got um, access to, to some of these additional resources. Now, what I'm not wanting to do, because there is such a positive vibe, and I think um, what we see also, there are positive signs, and we have heard from Lay, and we have seen, um, and we will hear, hear from Karaf even more, about how to really um, translate a crisis into an opportunity um, as well. And moving on, I think um, the Youth Collab has actually done something really um, smart uh, using their so innovative and uh, creative network and supported them, worked with them together to really um, come up with solutions um, that are supporting um, society on different um, levels, um, supporting the access to basic needs and essential services, um, really kind of lay it's a, a good model uh, or a good example of this and really supporting authorities um, to provide information and to track information. Um, there, there are interesting and amazing entrepreneurs out there that have digital platforms on mental um, health support. And I think I've seen even corporates um, here in Thailand using some of these entrepreneurship solutions to support their employees. So I think a lot of um, the, this innovation is needed right now. Um, and it's great to see that the Youth Collab is supporting that um, um, energy and that um, innovation. Um, UN Women has also done similar things in India with the, the government of India. We have just recently launched an uh, entrepreneurship um, challenge for female entrepreneurs to come up with um, COVID solutions or new business ideas to address some of the um, needs that come out of um, COVID. So there is some positive elements out of that. I, I just gonna give a couple of questions um, from the or take from the audience, but also um, to some of you that we had um, looked at before. I think Garaf, I would like to really turn it to you because you have shared um, initially that you had um, through the crisis um, a sort of leapfrogging moment and transferred or translated your whole business model from being a very physical face-to-face -face, um, interactive model paper-based ordering into a, a digital um, enterprise or a really digital enabled enterprise. Would you like to share a little bit more um, how you took this as an opportunity for Dharma Life? 
Sure, thank you, Katya. So what we did is, is, is basically we found our entrepreneurs who are village level leaders, kind of they were bombarded with questions. There was a lot of fear from the communities and they were kind of being asked what to do, I think, because they, looked, they were looked at as uh, kind of an influencer in that village community. And uh, so they came back to us and this came actually from the village entrepreneurs. They said, well, can you help us with something we could do productively in this situation? And uh, I mean, because there's a general sense of fear, uncertainty, and the, all the other points which you know are coming with the COVID crisis and kind of also while the government is doing a lot of communication, uh, kind of there's a lot of conflicting communication and misinformation as well. So what we then decided was uh, initially after a lot of uh, kind of brainstorming because the risks are very apparent, obviously, there's a lot of risks for them as well as, you know, kind of in general for wrong communication. Uh, so what we did is we aggregated some of these points. We went back to, to uh, our uh, core partners and kind of brainstormed and created a small kind of village alliance, um, before village alliance it's called. We'll be launching this further uh, soon. And we um, focused around four areas. One, can we use our entrepreneurs to digitally disseminate information, which is credible, uh, identify misinformation and kind of talk about that, play it back to the government and be a communication channel, number one. Number two, we aggregated essential goods and services needs and requests because a lot of times supply chains were broken. Um, and uh, we basically aggregated the, the needs and we then filled them with the supply chain. We, we were lucky enough to get the permits from the government to deliver even in this situation um, uh, in a contactless way. Um, the third thing we did is we um, also then uh, went out and, um, and kind of uh, started researching different groups. So you've all probably seen the migrant issues on the ground in India with the people getting stuck. So we started doing video interviews with all different kind of uh, stakeholders and then played that back as well to, to the resources. And the entrepreneurs are kind of essential in this and the tech piece, you know, we enabled them on, on our apps and on video conferencing platforms. And uh, I mean, data bandwidth was strong enough to do a video interview with the migrants. So I can, I mean, there's crazy pictures, but in that sense, and that we are now disseminating through our research partners. So, so this is also, you know, to your point on ecosystems, I mean, we're able to create a small ecosystem with government, with, um, with uh, research partners and, and corporates, Unilever, LBS, and School of Economics, et cetera. And um, yeah, and then finally, we're using, um, now going forward, we're actually plugging into other NGOs who have built apps and uh, kind of, um, which can be used for specific challenges like mental health and gender violence. So we're trying to do that next, right? But this is just a very, very quick snapshot. It's still work in progress as much as you can can do it in this situation. And, um, but at least it gives the opportunity to the entrepreneurs to survive and, and thrive somehow in the situation and as much as possible. Um, and this was all done with um, social distancing and norms in mind. So people didn't have to move. So whether that's WhatsApp or other platforms we used. Them. Great, thank you so much, um, Kavaf. I think it's all about resilience building of your models, right? I think to be prepared in the future. And I think um, I'm just echoing some of the comments here in, uh, that we get from the audience, amazing um, kind of solutions and how flexible and um, fast um, enterprises are. Lay um, one for you here. Um, I really just kind of read that out. It's just amazing. I'm so impressed with you. So I think it's good to give that feedback um, as well. Hey, I think there's um, an interest in your technology, um, the AI technology, and a question um, uh, about, do you see other use cases for this technology that can be scaled into the future? Um, any sort of other areas um, where you see this growing to? Um, so one important work that we are having right now, aside from uh, digital triages, was our work with UNDP Philippines on using chatbots as the in, as an innovative tool to um, uh, for household social impact as to conduct household social impact. Um, assessment surveys uh, among low income households, mm -hmm. and we have done this uh, in combi in with co-ownership with a large CSO network in the Philippines because we know that there are barriers right now, like for example, um, social distancing, ECQ, it's, we're on the lockdown. So we can't really um, get surveys or do the uh, ordinary um, uh, enumerators and randomization in low-income communities. So what we did was uh, because uh, we designed the chatbots to resonate with low-income households and then the questions there were taken from uh, UNDP's um, HSEA uh, library as well. And, and we've devised it such that it's going to be experimental. So we've done A-B testing, etc. So I think um, that's, yeah, so that's one, one way to scale it. 
Thank you so much, um, Lane. I don't want to do matchmaking, but I think Graph, there's something to be learned about um, what Lay is doing in your business model um, as well. So definitely that's going to happen, I guess, after this panel. Um, there are a couple of other um, interesting um, questions coming um, from the audience. Um, and there is one um, to Catherine actually about um, corporates, um, which, sorry. So one, maybe we're gonna start off on Catherine is one good for you as well, but anyone else can jump in here, Suchi maybe. Um, so we are obviously at the Business and Human Rights um, Forum, and there are a lot of UN guiding principles on um, business and human rights. And SMEs are so often overwhelmed with a, a lot that they have to do and have on their plate and to make their business run. How could we provide support um, to SMEs to comply to these guidelines for business and human rights? Um, or maybe even Ms. Tang, I think that could be a, a good one for you in Vietnam um, to answer that um, as well. Anyone? So, I mean, maybe a starting point, I think, um, to be honest, it's probably a very easy one, but start with creating awareness. Like a lot of the social entrepreneurs uh, we're working with don't have this top of mind even. Um, and uh, so I think making it part of the capacity building to create awareness um, and to probably share best practice um, and then help um, to work towards that step-by-step because uh, I think that, that um, yeah, often it needs time um, and, uh, and, and it, needs, it needs discussion, it needs learning. Um, and, and as I said, and as you mentioned as well, there is like, especially when you're starting out, there's so many topics um, that you somehow need to handle and can be quite overwhelming. Um, so I think, yeah, just starting to raise awareness uh, early on and, um, and then build from there and happy for everybody else to, to build on that maybe. I might, if no one else wants to answer, just maybe from a UN perspective, also adding on to this. Um, I think we do a very similar exercise right now, um, working also with Suchi with, with Andy together on understanding um, how can we add a gender lens um, to a lot of enterprises that are in Asia. I think it's, it's a bit the same thing. Um, so we have started to... Um, Put together more sort of a guiding principle but in a very easy way so UN Women has what we call the women's empowerment principles which, which is designed for medium and bigger sized companies as a set of um, seven uh, guiding principles and with clear actions and we're trying to kind of distill this now into a very sort of one two three guide for um, enterprise prices to add um, this gender lens is to your point Gaurav, you said you, you started gender neutral and i think that's what we see with many enterprises in the region and uh, not that they don't want to add the business and human rights lens or a gender um, lens but it's all about simplifying this and making um, resources easy um, accessible and implementable um, that's one observation that we have but if someone else wants to um, add in happy otherwise i'll gonna move on to um some more questions from the floor. Okay, so I'm um, going to do this. Later, there's another one for you about um, next month, there will be um, a lot of young people in the region um, be um, graduating and Blah, 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 sorry. Um, what would you, what, what would be your recommendations and key success factors that you can give them to join um, your ranks as young entrepreneurs? Um, uh, as, as what I've mentioned uh, earlier, it's always a journey from a small self and then you take, you know, steps to have a bigger self. And in order to, for this bigger self to happen, you have to continually challenge yourself to have, uh, to expand your horizon. And, and with this, after graduating, I, I think joining youth leadership networks, uh, volunteering and community works um, allows you to have a deeper understanding of social complexities, allows you to develop soft okay. skills as you get along with different people coming from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So then you also become a better leader and a better um, have better like sort of management in how to make decisions. And I think these are great foundations in, in finally taking that jump to be an entrepreneur. 
Thank yeah, you I so also, much. Yeah, I also Keep agree going. with yeah. I also agree with Lei because uh, here in Vietnam, you know, start startup is a kind of movement, and uh, for the, uh, the advice to the uh, for the one who read it this year. Uh, is that you know I, I found like uh, impact startup here they open a lot of call for uh, internship and also um, you know career you know uh, newbies to uh, to work for the for for, for for their for the business so yeah you, you can instead of set up your own now if the the the, the market is not ready yet so just start um, your career with a work up uh, with, uh, work with uh, impact startup already you know like in their uh, earlier of uh, Establishment. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ms. Tang. Um, to the audience, get ready. We're going to have a question for you in a, in a minute as well. So get your Menti devices out already. But before we're going to be doing this, I'm going to use um, two more questions. The one is for you, Sochi, um, more around the ecosystem and different players in the ecosystem. Why is the bulk of government financial interventions um, go to help big firms? Um, and uh, um, to banks, to um, stock exchanges, and why is there so little help um, and, and resources going to SMEs? Kind of maybe switch this question into, is there something what from your um, research and from your experience you are seeing as well, um, Suchi? And if so, um, any sort of um, reasoning behind that um, from your perspective? Right, so, and I'm gonna give you a very honest, what I think is an honest response to that, right? Because I think it, it centers around the perception of risk, right? So governments work with public money and the belief is that larger corporations are less risky. And this is kind of mimicked in the entire fundraising process, right? So you've got large exchanges for them, not too much happening on SME exchanges, right? Um, and I think the pointer is to sort of have, therefore, the SME ecosystem get together, right? So that you have the ability to be able to speak for yourself and represent your point of view, that's one. But I think the other is also the message that I think in general that we, that the SMEs should try and pick from what they see is, you know, our best practices. So how do we seem less risky? What can we learn from corporations in terms of, you know, across the board, uh, you know, how we fundraise, uh, how we report on information, you know, maybe push for having more active uh, SME stock exchanges. There have been attempts, uh, I know, across Asia, but they've not really been nearly as, as successful. So in a sense, you know, learn from there, learn what's good, try not to learn what's not so good, I think is, is sort of the only message I can give out there. But I think the ecosystem recognizes that as well, Katya. So what we're trying to do, especially since we're talking about the impact ecosystem, right? There is this recognition that, you know, SMEs are very cash step, the impact SMEs are cash strapped. So what can we do when that, the, that where they are, what they seem to want a lot more is access to debt than necessarily equity. That's not to say that that's not a problem. Uh, and I think they're trying to address it through various means. They're working with corporations to see how we can bring sort of blended finance instruments and other ways. We have non-banking financial institutions being called into the conversation to understand you know, how they can reduce the cost of raising capital and make it available at rates that are more affordable. These are some of the things that are happening. I will acknowledge we have a long way to go, but uh, I do believe that there are uh, you know, sort of good, um, there's good momentum that is being built in the region right now. Uh, and, and I do think that COVID will sort of push these ecosystem players to do more. Thank you so much, um, Suji. Um, since we have an investment banker in the room as well, or previous one, anything to add on this, um, Gora, from, from your perspective? I think one of the key things uh, we have seen on the ground is access to working capital being a massive issue. So from our entrepreneurs, you know, we've been uh, hearing and even from small shops in the surveys that, you know, they're deploying their working capital by giving credit and supporting the community a lot of times. Uh, and, and then the cycles are, are kind of gone at the moment, right? And um, we see this also in the microfinance space in India, where, you know, given the moratorium, these cycles are kind of stopped. Um, and uh, both on the business side and on the small kind of um, the, uh, borrower side. So I think that's one of the key issues where, while the government is doing uh, a lot now, it still is reaching and it's taking time. Um, uh, whereas on the positive side, the government support on the food side has been mostly in our experience great. And I think I spoke to, I think a hundred people or so in the last few weeks and 
everyone reached got their uh, their government um, their rations of food. So I think you have the two extremes: the business kind of working capital challenge, the food mm -hmm. side. I think the government is still stepping up and uh, hopefully reaching uh, re improving their speed. That's what we see in India at least. Well, I think that's um, obviously always, um, and I think that's for me an interesting learning in this. Um, crisis also that we have been conducting lots of sort of stakeholder interviews and rapid assessments with different stakeholders, government, um, bigger businesses and entrepreneurs. And the speed by which the entrepreneurs are operating is just amazing. I, I think there is, you can really kind of see the spectrum from the innovators and just testing and being no not risk averse taking um, um mistakes or making mistakes but then i think what you also see interestingly a lot of the solutions that come out of this are taken on by bigger companies or um, medium-sized companies even so to just make them bigger and by the time it comes to government it takes some time but then it, it comes into the system right so i think there's a role for everyone to to play but i think it's really important to see this um role of the, the entrepreneurs um, in, in this crisis. Um, and I think that is for me sort of a, a temperature check also for, for the future. Um, I think, and I hope that um, stakeholders are seeing this importance of um, entrepreneurs um, showing um, the future and showing the way and paving um, the way for new innovation that are more inclusive and more sustainable. And by this, I said it already before, um, we want to make sure that um, we get more of these entrepreneurs um, supported in the region. And we want to use the, the, the num high number of um, people participating today actually to have a little um, other Menti question um, for you. Um, so get up your menti.com. Um, we're going to just display um, the code again. And we're gonna have um, a question um, to you. What is needed from ecosystem players to particularly support young and female entrepreneurs um, in Asia Pacific? And again, as before, um, one or two words um, so that we kind of see a little bit um, where the temperature is and we can use this to also feed this back to um, the wider ecosystem. We see simulate creation. There's a question, what are ecosystem players um, referred? Um, so the, the governments, the role of governments, sorry, actually that's the right point. I think we, we use a lot, a lot of jargon always. So governments, the role of companies, um, the, co um, the support from um, NGOs, UN agencies, et cetera. So, personal networks, so equal opportunities, teamwork, government buy-in, access to finance, policy by government, mentorship incentives. So I think we have a, a really good um, set of um, input from your side as well, which we're going to be taking forward um, in really including this in our recommendations um, that we are um, sharing and discussing with the wider um, system that is working on entrepreneurship. So thank you very much for really this, um, this input from your side. But obviously before closing, I'm not um, gonna just close it like this with your input. Uh, it would be great if we could get our um, panelists um, the last time um, before I gonna thank you. Um, to kind of give a very short statement. I know that's difficult sometimes, but one key message um, that you would like to um, get the audience or take the audience away from the session or any advice or anything what you would um, like to share with the audience before we close it um, in two minutes. And I'm gonna start with Leigh who is beautifully on my screen, very big right now. So Leigh, over to you. Hi, um, I think something that I would like to emphasize that I haven't shared a while ago was uh, if there's any silver lining, because we have seen unprecedented growth because of COVID-19 opportunities and the way we were able to pivot and um, and just, you know, uh, uh, provide value during this crisis. I think what was really remarkable was uh, because of the crisis and we're all on Zoom, um, we became less uh, young and female. We became just a voice and the products 
has started to speak for itself. So I, I, I suppose the barriers about, you know, judging that, you know, the person in front of me is young and female sort of was gone because when we were go talking with government officials, with bigger tech startups, all they can hear is my voice and the products that we're producing. So I think that helped a lot in removing that barrier in, in this um, crisis. And, and yeah, and, and last note would be courage. I think courage just to push and push and believe that if you continually challenge yourself, but also manage that with skills and continually bringing value, I think it goes a long way. Thank you so much. Um, Le, um, over to you, Catherine. Yeah, um, thanks. And building on what Leigh just said, definitely sort of from do school perspective, speaking to both sides, first to entrepreneurs, or also the question came up about people graduating now, uh, we're, we're believe in doing, like you will only grow the skills and the mindsets and the confidence whilst you're in it. You don't grow that from thinking about it. Um, and so definitely the encouragement to to get out there. And, and if you're passionate, if you want to create change, then, then start uh, and you will grow in the process. And then for the larger corporates, um, just make sure you don't underestimate the opportunities that are in collaborating with small and medium enterprises, with entrepreneurs, with innovators, um, uh, to to bring sol new solutions to life, and um, I'm hoping that this will become a lot more the standard in in sort of you know creating new solutions going forward. Thank you, um, Suchi. You are the next on my screen. Um... Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Katya. Uh, you said one thing, right? And, and, and I'm going to focus on the issue of women and gender. I'm going to try and keep it simple. So hopefully people will remember if there's one thing that I believe that you could really try and do is just collect gender disaggregated data. Ask yourselves every time you're doing something, what is the impact this has on women? So whether it's women as employees, whether it's women entrepreneurs, just a one thing, it seems simple, but I have seen so many, so many folks in the ecosystem and entrepreneurs still not do gender disaggregated data. So one message, gender disaggregated data, please. I gonna undersign this one. Miss um, Tang, over to you. Okay, so actually I'd like to talk to um, all the youths who are studying in universities and all the universities um, uh, out there in the region, because uh, seeing our role in the ecosystem as the ecosystem builder, <laughs> I believe, I strongly believe, like the the, the universities can uh, play, uh, can play a, 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 a you know a significant role in cutting connecting the dots, like you know connecting all resources here because you have infrastructure, you have the knowledge, you have the young people, you have the alumni networks and you know, infrastructures, location, everything you have. Uh, so um, universities uh, should play a very important role in, uh, in building the ecosystem for social authorship in the region. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Tang. Um, and um, Gawaf, I think um, you are the last on my screen um, for a final words or statement. I think I would just say that um, despite all the complexity, uncertainty, and, and negativity, it's important to stay positive and survive and thrive. Pivot your model whatever to whatever is required. Just uh, you know, be persistent and at the work. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, there was a, a nice um, closure. What I'm trying to do is I'm just going to wrap it up um, very briefly with um, what you have said and bring this together in, in five things. So. I think the first one, be digital. I think without your business model, probably will have a problem in the in the future. Be brave and do things. Um, be connected. And here we mean connecting universities, private sector, bigger corporates, networks, be connected with, with each other. Um, be gender sensitive and stay 
positive and um, happy in all what you are doing. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, such a great panel, the panelists, but also um, participants for sharing your insight to the levels possible in a digital format. Um, we definitely gonna um, take this forward. Uh, very grateful for all of your participation and have a wonderful and happy day. Ciao, ciao, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Katya. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.